When Grand Theft Auto 3 was released for the PlayStation 2 in 2001, it was a groundbreaking moment. With its fully 3D open world and ability to drive, run around on foot and shoot, while dealing with themes of drugs, robbery and murder, heavily inspired by movies and TV. Despite anger from activist groups, parents and politicians, Rockstar had finally made a video game that coincided with the word cool, and many people who weren't even interested in gaming bought a PlayStation 2 just to play GTA 3. Rockstar continued to make games including Max Payne and State of Emergency, and developer DMA Design who were acquired by Take-Two Interactive in 1999 changed their name to Rockstar North. But the only thing being talked about was Grand Theft Auto. Even though GTA 3 was released in 2001, it continued to be popular, becoming the second best selling game of 2002. What was number one? Well. Becoming more experienced with the PlayStation 2 hardware, and using the same game engine from their successful predecessor, the next step was to see what the genre was truly capable of. According to director and producer Leslie Benzies, immediately after the release of GTA 3, DMA Design were only focused on making content for the PC port, but they decided to create a new standalone title after they came up with so many ideas. The development team unanimously agreed to set it in 1986 Miami. They grew up in the 80s, and it was the decade that stood out the most. After a year of development, Grand Theft Auto Vice City was released exclusively for the PlayStation 2 in October 2002, and for the PC and Xbox Worldwide by January 2004. It was highly promoted through posters in the cities and non-gaming magazines, another example of Rockstar revolutionizing marketing, and how mature video games are perceived. I'm in the city. <laughs> Shit. Didn't they? They never let him out. He kept his head down. Helps people forget. People will remember soon enough. When they see him walking down the streets of their neighborhoods, it will be bad for business. Well, what are we gonna do, Sonny? We treat him like an old friend and keep him busy out of town, okay? Set 15 years before the events of GTA 3, the Ferrellis are the most powerful family in Liberty City, but mob boss Sonny wants to expand his business to Vice City. Vice City is 24 karat gold these days. The Colombians, the Mexicans, hell, even those Cuban refugees are cutting themselves a piece of some nice action. Their contact Ken Rosenberg sets up a meeting with the Vance brothers and send Tommy Facetti, fresh off a 15 year prison sentence, to South Beach to act as the Ferrelli dealer. I think we have a deal, my friend. <laughs> oh, shit. Unfortunately for them, the deal was an ambush with Tommy barely escaping and- you better be kidding me, Tommy. Tell me you still got the money. No, Sonny. I don't have the money. That was my money, Tommy! My money! Tommy persuades Sonny that he will get his money back, exploring the city for clues as well as doing a few jobs for others. But this is Grand Theft Auto we're talking about. The real goal for Tommy is to become the most successful gangster in Vice City. Listen to me. The time to take over this town is now. It's all out there waiting for us. Instead of only being told what to do on a revenge mission, it looks like it at first. It's Tommy's idea to take over the city. He takes initiative and is actually conversing with some of the best supporting characters of the GTA series, improving story engagement. Do I look like I can intimidate a jury? I couldn't intimidate a child, and believe me, I've tried. Like GTA 3, the story is part of the city itself. It's not the most important aspect of the game, but it's one of the funniest and most outlandish of the series, even if the antagonists are only relevant in the last couple of missions. Tommy, rip that guy a new asshole for me. I'm gonna rip him too! As you can probably tell, Miami Vice, Scarface, and Carlito's Way were huge inspirations, setting itself in a shrunken 1980s Miami with so many colors, drugs, ultraviolence, and style. Anyone who knew Sam Hauser will tell you he loves Miami Vice. Vice City was in the first game, but this was before the developers wanted to make Grand Theft Auto a pop culture phenomenon. Right after the release of GTA 3, the development team watched plenty of movies and television, then flew to Miami to soak in as much as possible. Also, you know you have a great game when even the booklet is fun to read. I like that it presents itself as a tourist guide, areas of interest, and getting around. Yet it illustrates the gameplay mechanics like an actual booklet, and probably would have been a handy alternative to the 100% checklist if you had no incident in 2002. I'm stretched like a wire, and even if I'm dead by the end of the week, I'd like to think that I didn't die poor. Now just okay? calm down, both of you. Rockstar increased the volume of recognizable talent, including Ray Liotta, Tom Sizemore, William Fincher, Dennis Hopper, Burt Reynolds, Danny Trejo, Gary Busey, and Philip Michael Thomas. The latter can't be a coincidence. The way I see it, we two hombres in a strange town. We need to watch each other's back. My back's just fine, brother. You sure about that? 
However, having game developers working with celebrities, very different personalities and mindsets on how to create a media, some of the working relationships were destined to be difficult, according to the crew. Many of the people we have worked with have been fantastic and a real joy to have on board, but some have perhaps seen themselves as bigger than the project. Whatever happens, all voices work with their characters and it adds to the movie TV love letter Rockstar we're aiming for. Fly shooting real popular in the army? Glad I don't pay tax. You trying to be funny, kid? <laughs> but the biggest star is the city itself. Now this game will feel heavily outdated if you're used to GTA 5 for example. It's like returning to an amusement park you loved as a kid for the first time in a decade. It can still be fun, it'll just take a moment for your mind to adjust. But after reviewing GTA 3 recently and becoming used to its simplicity, I do notice a few additions and improvements in comparison. Again, note that any criticisms mentioned here have been improved in future GTA titles, so take them as know what to expect notices. Grand Theft Auto Vice City maintains the 3D open world gameplay that created another genre in itself. But with only a year to develop, all Rockstar North could do was improve on what they built on. The city itself has a longer draw distance and more detailed sprites. However, with increased slowdown, two islands instead of three and more cramped streets, compromises had to be made. Once again, the map mostly consists of roads and buildings with a few beaches. There was an idea to create wetlands much like the Everglades, but since they implemented forests, deserts and three individual cities in just the next title with the same engine, this is perfectly acceptable. But whatever city Rockstar was setting in, it needed an in-game map system. It's common now, but it was nowhere to be seen in GTA 3. Occasionally I would attempt to reach a marker only to find it's on another island without much indication. In Vice City, the map is in the pause menu, pinpointing where all the important locations are including where to go next during a mission. I've always wanted to review Vice City ever since I started this channel, but because my copy of the game crashes almost every time I play it, or to be more precise, during the motorbike chase in the mission Guardian Angels, I would often fall through the ground and a discreet error message would pop up. My initial plan was to unlock the second part of the map and just go insane from there on out because I was fed up with seeing this constantly. But by the time I got the mansion, it surprisingly never did it again. It's like the game is rewarding me for my perseverance. As a result, I save every single time I complete a mission just to be sure. The fact they made a full city with multiple gameplay elements and things to do in one game, let alone on a PlayStation 2 or Xbox or mobile is a huge accomplishment. Glitches will always be present in a video game, especially if it's pushing the system limitations. You get the sense the developers were begging for another generation so they could create what they've always wanted without restrictions. But at least sticking with the same game engine meant their artistic merit wasn't compromised. And neither was the gameplay, but not in a good way. Tommy controls exactly like Claude from GTA 3. Low stamina, can't jump on ledges, crouch or swim. I don't get why the ability to swim wasn't introduced here because there are more missions where a boat is required. Movement is extremely touchy when sprinting and there's no way to move the camera freely. You make me run out. Vice City introduces new weapons like auto shotguns, revolvers and mini guns. Though I really wish they could have fixed the way you aim. Every time you shoot at something, you're always exposed to gunfire because there's no cover system. And sometimes it aims at the complete opposite of where you want to aim. Like here. Uh. That was a disaster. And I never use a heavy weapon like an M4 or sniper unless I have no other choice, like missions where you're in a vehicle, because the manual aim sensitivity is way too touchy. The PC version is better because it allows you to strafe and aim with the mouse, but if you have a console version, only use a weapon that can auto aim at enemies, because you need to take them down quick. It's a relief the enemies in general can't shoot accurately either. So yeah, the on foot and weapon controls in the console version have aged pretty badly. But as mentioned before, when you consider that Rockstar North only had a year to make it, all they could really focus on was adding more content. These controls back then were good enough to get what needed to be done, it's not impossible. And it's gotten better over time. Tommy, Hillary's taking up too much room. I am not! R2! Hey, shut up you two, or you can get out and walk. Yeah, Hillary. At least the vehicle controls are more acceptable. Vasetti can run, drive, ride and fly to navigate the city. Cars and boats control the same as GTA 3, although the camera tilts a little bit when steering. Bikes wobble all over the place when braking, but are still cool to ride around. And planes and helicopters don't control anywhere near as well as the future titles. For example, planes don't have rudders or landing gear, but at least you have the ability to fly without the game itself trying to stop you. And they had to start somewhere. 
Though I don't get why so many people complain about the mission Demolition Man. I thought it was easy. Or maybe it's because I've played so much GTA San Andreas and already know how to fly. Or maybe the PS2 version isn't so bad. It must be the PC or mobile versions. Whatever vehicle you're using, with over a hundred songs and countless hours of dialogue, there will be at least one radio station worth listening to. In fact, it might be one of the best licensed soundtracks ever in a video game. All the missions part of completing 100% like payphones, hidden packages, unique stunt jumps, taxi, vigilante, firefighter and ambulance return. But more have been added including pizza delivery, shooting range and... I always wonder why there are so many buildings you can go inside but don't provide much purpose. Until you realise you're meant to rob them. But the biggest introduction to the series is becoming a massive businessman. We are now under new management and things are gonna change around here again. Our new management thing. Which gang are you? Well, I'm not part of any gang, actually. When you begin to make money and get yourself a big mansion, you unlock the ability to purchase properties across the city including nightclubs, car dealerships and film studios. Each property has their own missions and completing them all will give you a profitable asset. This is one of the most underrated parts of the game that revolutionized the series, not only because it's one of the biggest motivators to complete 100% of the whole game, but it influenced all the stories that came after like San Andreas and Five. Leslie Benzie said it himself. GTA 3 is a revenge story, whereas Vice City is about building an empire. I own you now. I own all of this. We're gonna turn this place around. I'm gonna make you rich. You have to purchase at least seven of the nine properties and acquire the assets in order to unlock the final missions. But the order of properties you purchase is entirely up to you, adding freedom to the story mode as well. The properties also work as safe houses. At the beginning, the first one is a hotel in the most southeast part of the map, which means you're frequently driving a long way to reach a marker. But because this map isn't that big by today's standards and the mansion is almost dead center, it's not that big of a deal. But whatever you do, don't save your progress at the Cherry Top Ice Cream Company. From what I hear, saving there in the original PS2 version will corrupt the save file. The Cherry Top Ice Cream Company was the first property I purchased because it was the closest to the mansion. But after realizing there weren't any cutscene based missions, I changed my mind, reloaded and purchased something else. So theoretically, I was incredibly close to having no choice but to play this game all over again. Which I would never do because of my frustrations with discrete error messages. As you progress through the game, outfits become more diverse including suits, casuals and workers attire, but you have to go to a specific clothing store to change outfits, as opposed to having a wardrobe like future titles. Normally I give the protagonists the right outfits in GTA to make the cutscenes look believable, but I didn't bother this time because Facetti will always be remembered for the blue Hawaiian shirt, jeans and sneakers. Look at him! All dressed up like that! What is this? Ladies night? The money you earn in Vice City, you actually have to think about how to spend you know, balance between weapons and properties. Ammo especially for heavy weapons are not easy to come by. I ended up completing all the storyline missions with a net worth not even passing 100 grand. Completing 100% gives you a few rewards that would be handy in missions like twice as much health, armor and car damage. Oh yeah, and the Frankie outfit. But they're only good for longer rampage runs because you've completed everything by then. I'm fine with that because you thought I forgot about it. For a lot of gamers, the only reason why you play Grand Theft Auto is to do all the things you can't do in real life. I've already gone into huge details to why rampaging was so entertaining in my GTA 3 review, so I'll only be brief. Despite new features, the moment you're controlling Tommy Facetti, okay, you have to at least reach the first safe spot, but you have the map to yourself. All the missions, challenges, and properties, you can ignore everything and just go crazy. The only thing changed from 3 to Vice City is that the police send in Vice Squads and Spike Strips when you reach a 3 star wanted level. In 2002, the gameplay mechanics might have felt similar, but with a new map, soundtrack and more vehicles and weapons, it felt fresh enough to wow gamers across the world with its aggressive gameplay. This whole damn country needs a kick in the ass, and we're the ones to deliver it. But special interest groups were just as aggressive in reducing sales numbers for its violent and explicit content. The German release for example, money doesn't drop on the ground when you kill someone, nor is there any blood or rampage missions whatsoever. But surprisingly, the Australian version didn't censor any of that. Nor this one cut away the prostitution and all the sex scenes in the film studio missions. Please, oh, tell me God. you got that. Was that part of the, uh, 
Or was she talking to? Hey, I can never tell, anyway. The uncensored version was eventually released in Australia in 2010, but one thing that was cut in future releases worldwide was references to Haitian immigrants. Haitian human rights groups staged a protest in New York condemning Vice City in relation to the references, with Mayor Michael Bloomberg getting involved. Take Two and Rockstar apologized for any offense caused, and all future releases of Vice City removed all the references, which is obvious in the dialogue. And Jack Thompson, who sued Rockstar, Sony Computer Entertainment, and Walmart in 2003 for $245 million relating to a teen murder, did the exact same thing as it pertained to Vice City, twice suing all three companies for $600 million in 2003 and 2006. A video game with a 1980s Miami open world based on popular media like Scarface and Miami Vice, with violence reaching the point of blood squirting onto the camera, was always going to cause uproar from the non-gaming community. But while it caused a few major headaches for the publishers, it didn't stop people buying this game. Because what was the number one best selling game of 2002? It was Grand Theft Auto Vice City. The grand total of copies sold reached over 21 million across all platforms, with nearly half those sales coming from the PlayStation 2 alone. It may not have the same level of groundbreaking innovation the third game had, the controls are rough around the edges by today's standards, and it only took under 8 hours to beat. But Rockstar was so far ahead in the genre back in the early 2000s, they knew the limitation of 6th gen systems, and players were so blown away by GTA 3, all they really wanted was more of it. And that's exactly what they got. A brand new map with memorable characters and additional weapons and game modes, while keeping what made the predecessor revolutionary. There's a good reason why so many choose Vice City as their favorite in the GTA series, even with future releases. That is why it's considered one of the greatest and highest selling video games of the 6th generation. It was a blueprint of things to come from Rockstar in the future. Should they ever return to Vice City? Who knows? But if they do, it needs to be set in the past.